Ichmin. Asach von Eich sind schon da, fällen mir an Heben. So. Um, and one second. We're going to begin right now. Uh, so welcome everyone, Zeit Bagrist. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are absolutely thrilled to have such a large turnout. My name is Miri Coral, and I'm the director of the California Institute for Yiddish Culture and Language. And today, actually, uh, today's event marks the 15th year of the Yiddish Institute's Showcase of Contemporary Yiddish Culture. But CYCLE, which is our acronym, has been active since 2000 when we launched the first ever winter Yiddish intensive in the world called the Art of Yiddish. And it was the first ever Yiddish intensive on the West Coast. For two weeks, we brought together the foremost Yiddish instructors and experts in the world for participants from across the country and globe. And it remained an annual template for um, and sole such Yiddish intensive for seven years. And for the last, for 13 years, Cycles Showcase has illuminated beloved and often surprising aspects of Yiddish culture for Yiddish Liebhobels in person in the LA area. And for the past two years, gulp, <laughs> thanks to the great Ness, the great miracle of technology, we've been able to bring you such programs directly to where you are. None of this would have been possible without the support of donors and members. And I thank each and every one of you who has acted on your appreciation for what the Yiddish Institute does. Now, we would love to be able to conduct our events entirely in Yiddish. And believe me, our current speaker could do that really well and a beautiful Yiddish. Uh, and of course, this is also uh, the lingua franca for all of you attending today. But in the interest of being fully understood, uh, we'll continue to use that other lingua franca, which is English. So before I introduce today's guest, I also want to thank our co-sponsors for today and the rest of the series with Professor Weiser. And that includes the Toronto UJA Committee for Yiddish, especially Vivian Felsen. And it was really through one of their events that I even learned about this, our wonderful speaker today, uh, Colin Weiser. Uh, and also I wanna thank a relatively newly minted uh, organization, which is called Del Nistel LA, and especially Zachary Golden for being behind the scenes, the technical director for today. Professor Weiser will be speaking for about 40, 45 minutes, uh, and then we'll have about 15 minutes for questions. So please do type any questions you might have into the Q&A function in the bottom of your screen, uh, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So to introduce uh, our speaker for today, um, Professor Kalman Weiser, Weiser, uh, is a sought after speaker in both English and Yiddish on topics related to modern Jewish history and culture, specifically about language issues in Jewish life. He is the Silber Family Professor of Modern Jewish Studies and is currently the acting director of the Koshitsky Center for Jewish Studies at York University in Toronto. His late, the latest book that he edited is Key Concepts in the Study of Antisemitism. And other books include Jewish People, Yiddish Nation, Noah Pilutski, and The Focus in Poland, which explores the rise and fall of the nationalist movement on behalf of Yiddish in Russia and Poland until World War II. He also edited Yiddish, a Survey and a Grammar, uh, and um, among other books, he recently completed a manuscript about Max Weinreich and Solomon Birnbaum and their German colleagues who became Nazis, tentatively titled Confronting Hitler's Professors, Yiddish Scholars, and the Holocaust. 
some of that uh, topic you will hear about in the March 13th talk with Professor Weiser. And just a reminder, the next talk in this series is on February 13th, also at 11 o'clock, and it's von Wannenstamm der Yid, uh, new and old theories about the origins of Yiddish and the origins of Ashkenazi Jews. So we will have something wonderful to look forward to down the road as well. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Kalman Weiser. Thank you very much. Uh, you can hear me fine, I assume. So I am going to um, share my screen. That'll just take me a second. Okay, great. So I can see Zach, which is good because I can at least see one person's face because it's very odd talking to the void. All right, so I'm gonna talk for the next 40 or so minutes and then I'll be happy to entertain your questions. Now, the main themes I'm going to be talking about is how Jews, Ashkenazic Jews got their names, their personal names and their family names and the troubles that they've caused them. And there's a whole variety of problems that names have created for Jews and ways in which they've tried to address them. What I'm simply showing you here on this opening screen is the problem that genealogical researchers face today. I'll touch upon this, but it's not my main concern. That is, you see how Jewish names have morphed with immigration and due to the various hands that have registered them. Here you see a Jew from the Russian Pale Settlement, Yudol Itzkevich Sochet, that is Shochet in the Lithuanian pronunciation where Sos and Shuz are not clearly distinguished, becomes Yudol Shochet later in life, then he comes to America, he eventually becomes Jacob Schoer. This is one of the things I'll be talking about. How do these names, how do they transform themselves with immigration and due to the various hands their registration passes through? But I'm really interested in the bureaucratic problems that Jewish names have created with Gentile authorities and how they got these names. So and without further ado, I'll get to the story. Um, those of you who are familiar with the world of Polish Jewish theater might be familiar with a category of something like cabaret called schmontzes. Schmontzes are sort of like vaudeville type jokes. And there was a joke circulating around the interwar period. How do you know that America is controlled by Jews? And the joke ran that of course America is controlled by Jews. And that's really what they're doing is they're paraphrasing the, the growing anti-Semitic movement in Poland that charged that America was, charged, was controlled by Jews. You know this because America's founding fathers were all Jews. Think of names like Samuel Adams, Benjamin Franklin, of course, a little bit later, Abraham, Abraham Lincoln. All of these biblical first names in the Polish mind are associated with Jews. The name Adam is a Polish name, but Jews seldom use it in Eastern Europe. But all the other ones, Be Be uh, Benjamin, Abraham, and so on, are all Jewish names. Now, this, of course, was a joke making fun of anti-Semites and their misunderstanding and their, their ridiculous perceptions, in this case, of British Protestants, who also had an affection for the Hebrew Bible, as did Jews. Jews also had their own jokes about Jewish name changing. Um, one of the famous jokes that you're probably familiar with is about the shtetl Jew from Eastern Europe, Moshe Pisha, who moves to Germany to pursue his doctorate, becomes a doctor there in medicine, becomes Moritz Goldwasser, and then, of course, his career expands and he moves to Paris where he becomes Maurice de la Fontaine. And this is, of course, a joke about the typical upstart Jew, parvenu Jew, who's moving his way up the ranks and forgets his tries to mask his Jewish ancestry, but it's apparent to everybody else, especially to his fellow Jews. But there, of course, Jewish names were not only a source of humor for Jews, they were also a painful source of mockery from anti-Semites. Uh, one of the most famous cases, for example, was in Germany in the 1920s, when a the deputy police chief of Berlin, whose name was Bernhard Weiss, was mocked by Goebbels, the later propaganda minister of the Nazi regime, he would call him Isidore. Why did he call him Isidore? And this became a major scandal. Weiss ended up suing him for libel. 
because it was known Isidore had become a term to mock Jews, the same way Itzik, Cohen, and Shmuel had. If you wanted to mock a Jew, you didn't call him by his actual name, which is often indistinguishable from a non-Jew's name. Think of the name Bernhard Weiss. It's not marked as Jewish. But names like Isidore had a greater frequency amongst Jews than non-Jews, even though it wasn't of Jewish origin. And of course, Itzik, Cohen, and Shmuel were distinctively Jewish names. So by reducing a Jew to his his Jewish name, even if he didn't have a specifically Jewish name, this was a way of drawing attention to his identity as a Jew and to belittle him. Coleman, can I just interrupt you for a second? Yes. You might want to make this full screen. Oh, the, I'm sorry. The presentation, the presentation. Yes, let me do that. I see, I forgot to press play from start. There we go. Okay, great. Now, what about Eastern Europe where most of the Jews were found by the modern era? There was a very specific problem, and this is a big theme for today, as Jews began to be integrated into states, or as rather as states began to want Jews to integrate, they required Jews like everybody else to take on fixed family names and to register their births, their deaths, and their marriages. In traditional Jewish societies, like non-Jewish societies, family names were not necessary. If you lived in a small town, a small community like a shtetl, of a few thousand people, most people knew you. You'd probably encounter them. Jews used double names quite often, names like uh, Itzik Alter, you know, two names to distinguish you, Itzik, from another Itzik. It wasn't necessary to have fixed names. Gentiles had their own version of this story. But by the 19th century, as the bureaucracy of the state begins to count and measure people, its population, it begins to insist that you, re you register where you live, whom you're married to, and what your name is that can be passed on to future generations. Now, we all know this, of course, from the census. Uh, one of the big reasons for this is to tax you. Another reason is for military service. Military service was a very painful issue in the Russian Empire. Jews began to be uh, inducted into the Russian military by the 1820s. There were quotas on Jewish military recruitment. The law was that an only son, because he was all that the family had to support it, did not have to be inducted into the military. And yet many only sons were. Now there's a famous story from Shul Malachim, from Plesiv, back to the draft is the trans, back from the draft is the title in English that I'm going to read to you in a bit. But let me give you the setup. It dramatizes the problem of a family that had two sons. The first son died at birth. The second son survived to adulthood. But the Russian authorities don't realize the second son is the only living son. Moreover, the second son has multiple names, as is according to Jewish tradition. Jews had a Hebrew, Jewish children had a, males had a, so, so to speak, a name to use for synagogue purposes. They also had a vernacular name. You might be Yitzchak when you're called to read from the Torah, but you're Itzik in everyday life. Furthermore, if a Jewish child suffered an illness and recovered during infancy and you wanted to protect him from the evil eye, you probably gave him a new name like Alter, if he's a male, to suggest that he is an old man so the angel of death should not come looking for a young child. So Jews have a very complicated naming process. Their naming practices are not obvious to Russian authorities. Jews had to go to uh, official government employed rabbis to register their births and their deaths. They didn't always do so. They often simply dealt with their local village or shtetl rabbi who wasn't government approved. And when they did go to the government official, one government official might spell a Jewish name one way or might even correct it to what he thinks is a better version of the name. Don't write Itzik, write Yitzchak, and so on. And then another Russian official or a Russian Jewish rabbi might spell it a different way. All this meant is that when you went to the draft board and you showed the documents, name did not appear in the same form every time, which raised suspicions amongst Russian authorities who then believed that you were trying to hide a son. And this caused many, many problems for Jews in Tsarist Russia. So let me read this quote from Shul Malachim. To make a long story short, what's the use of long-winded histories and twice-told tales? They were summoning my Itzik, Alter. That is, to the draft board once again, 
My wife, bless her, raised the roof. My daughter-in-law passed out. It was perfectly disgraceful. Travel the length and breadth of the entire world and see if you could find one instance where an only son and one and only boy with an honest to goodness officially attested to first class exemption should be called to the draft board three times. But go talk Tur Turkish or Tartar, there was nothing to be done. So I ran to our communal leaders and shouted blue murder. I just about succeeded in getting 10 people to swear out an affidavit saying that they were positive that Itzik is Avram Yitzchak, that Avram Yitzchak was Alter, and that Alter and Itzik and Avram Yitzchak were all one and the same person, right? Hence, you see the, the great problems that all these Jewish names created, the naming practices not being transparent. Now, there were various attempts to correct this situation in the 19th century to try and explain Jewish naming practices to czarist officials and also to reform Jewish naming practices to make it simpler for government officials. And these attempts were often quite ideological. And I'm just going to highlight two of these attempts, two of the many. One of the first attempts is what you see on the left from the 1860s in Poland. It was made by a learned Jew who was a Maskil, a proponent of the Jewish Enlightenment, named Rotwand. He was a graduate of the Polish language rabbinical seminary that briefly existed in the middle of the 19th century in, in Warsaw. He created a list, a book with two lists side by side. On one hand was the incorrect Jewish name, meaning the name that Jews actually used. On the right hand column was the correct Jewish name, which was the version that he wanted Jews to register in Latin letters on official government forms. Very often this was a name that was similar to a classical Hebrew form. So not Itzik, but Yitzchak, or it was the it was the Polish language version of a biblical name. So for instance, not uh, Avram, but Abraham. Um, not Shulamis, but Salomea. All right, so this was what he was trying to do. He was trying to encourage Jews to register their children's births, but also to register them with names and Latin letters that would make sense to Polish officials. On the right-hand side, you have another book that was made in the 1920s in Warsaw, also, both were made in Warsaw, actually. It was made by the leadership of the Jewish community of Warsaw, which was then controlled by Zionists, who did a very similar thing. They said Jews are having tremendous problems registering their names in independent Poland. We're finally citizens. We're integrating into society. We're proudly Jewish, but we're also proudly Polish. Jews, first of all, you have to register your names and do it in Latin letters. Secondly, we have to correct our bizarre spellings of names and our distortions, i.e. our Yiddish versions of names, into the appropriate Hebrew forms or the appropriate Polish forms. So again, it's very much the same story. Uh, however, in this case, the appropriate forms usually meant Hebrew with a Sephardic pronunciation. Uh, so you can imagine the various, someone whose, so someone whose name was, I don't know, uh, Leib is now Arya. Uh, someone who's not, whose name was Itzikl is now Yitzchak, and so on. And the same thing with girls' names. Or they would be in a classical Polish form that's used in the Bible. Uh, a slightly different ideology, but the, ba the same basic idea. Now, diaspora nationalists, who were usually Yiddishists, fought against this. They insisted that Yiddish names were just fine. Um, there's nothing to be embarrassed by, by Yiddish name. Uh, Poles don't use the nicknames. Jews do use their nicknames. Hasidic Rebbes often call themselves by their first names. Uh, Levi Yitzchak, we don't call him by his last name. We don't call him Levi Yitzchak, we call him Levi Yitzchak. Let us do this same thing with our names. There's no reason to be ashamed that we call our children Zavremel and Yitzchak and so on and Yitzchakl. Let us register it on the birth certificates as we speak. Now, what did most Jews do? Uh, it's a long story and I'll make it short. They did whatever they wanted to do. Jews registered their names in all sorts of ways, uh, which created a lot of nightmares for Polish officials. The Polish Jewish press in Yiddish is full of very funny stories, probably apocryphal, of Jews creating new names to honor their deceased relatives. Names like Urina, which I can't believe at all, someone gave this name to a daughter. Urina to be named after a grandfather named Aaron, and many other ridiculous names. 
Okay. Of course, you're probably familiar with the bitter problem Jews had in Nazi Germany, that whereas previously we've seen attempts to integrate Jews through various forms of assimilating their names to the norms of the larger society, here in Nazi Germany, they forced upon Jews a policy of dissimulation to make them easily readable, to make them make clear who was a Jew so they could be excluded and eventually murdered. Uh, you're probably familiar with the giving of middle names Israel and Sarah on documents to Jews because Jewish names in Germany were hardly obviously Jewish most of the time. Now, of course, this brings us to the very difficult question, the very interesting question of what is a Jewish name and how do we identify a, a name as such as Jewish? Are some names inherently Jewish? And how should we register these names? What's the proper form of a Jewish name? By the way, I'll just point out on the left, a book I highly recommend, Rosenberg by Any Other Name, by a scholar named Kirsten Vermaglis that came out a few years ago, a book by a woman who said that her own name caused so much confusion. How do you pronounce the name Kirsten Vermaglis? It's a Jewish name, Vermaglis, but Kirsten's hardly considered a Jewish name. All of this inspired her to write a book about Jews and their naming practices, and it mainly deals with how Jews changed their names when they came to the United States a topic I'll come back to a bit later. Now, if you were facing me, I could play this game with you, but I can't because obviously I don't see you, um, but I'll play it myself. I play it with students sometimes. I play, throw out a name to them and I ask them, what does this name mean to you? Who is this person? So the first nation name I give them is Isidore Schwartz. Now my students are getting younger and younger. Of course, I'm not getting any older, but fewer and fewer of them recognize the name Isidore as a stereotypically Jewish name. Names like Isidore, Stanley, and so on are names that were very common amongst the immigrant generation of Jews, Jews who were acculturating usually from Yiddish to the dominant language of the state, whether it was uh, Yiddish, English or German or something else. Max and Rose Schwartz are the names you see everywhere in Toronto on public buildings. Also probably the, the children of immigrants or first generation North American English speakers. Scott Schwartz might be familiar to them. Scott Schwartz is a probably a second or third generation Jew born somewhere in the suburbs of a major American city in the 1960s or 1970s. Let's say Scott Schwartz comes from Glencoe, Illinois. Then there's Chaim Schwartz or Chaim Schwartz who is probably a Satmar Chosid in Brooklyn, in Williamsburg, because names like Schwarz and Weiss, black and white, are very common, particularly amongst Jews from the Hungarian cultural sphere where Satmar Jews have their origins. Okay, so names have their meanings, but these meanings are determined by social context. Uh, very, uh, Schwartz itself, for example, is not an inherently Jewish name. I could find many Schwartzes in the American Midwest or in places like Germany who are not Jewish at all. But of course, in certain parts of the United States and Canada, Schwartz is a stereotypically Jewish name. The same thing goes with my name, Weiser, very common in Germany and very common in Israel. Okay, uh, for reasons that are probably obvious to you, but we'll explore a little bit uh, in a few minutes. Now back to the question of what is an inherently Jewish name, what about first names? Uh, Jews have a very funny thing, a very funny practice. When Jews change their family names, we often accuse them of trying to hide their Jewishness, trying to escape from being Jewish. When the fact is that Jews have only had family names for a few centuries and didn't really start paying attention to them, usually until the 20th century. But Jews, of course, have always had first names. And yet many first names in the Jewish tradition are of obviously non-Jewish origin. Take names like Moses, which is Egyptian, Esther and Mordechai, uh, Ishtar and Marduk of Babylonian origin, Alexander, Kalman, my name, Todros, Greek origin, Yenta from Gentile, Romance origin, Zlata is of Slavic origin. And I can go on and on with names like Fivish and Bunum and Be'er, of Romance or Germanic origin, which are, have become classic Jewish names, okay? Uh, it's not so much the names themselves being somehow Jewish, it's more that the Jews choose these names 
and use them more than other people that makes these names Jewish. And that's what I mean by the importance of social context. Now, this whole naming issue became a very serious crisis around the 19th century as Jews first began to integrate, to acculturate in European states. On the left-hand side, you have the Chatam Sofer, the Chassim Sofer, the famous rabbi from Germany who later moved to Hungary because he was really retreating from the inroads of the Haskalah, the Jewish enlightenment that encouraged integration and acculturation and states that were pushing Jews to speak the language of the land, to change their dress, to change their names. In fact, in his ethical will, he spoke of the fact that, according to Jewish tradition, Jews were worthy for redemption, or that is, the children of Israel were worthy for redemption from slavery in Egypt for three things, because they did not change their names, their dress, or their language. Now, all of this is quite questionable, but it really responds to the pressures that were affecting Jews in the late 18th and the first half of the 19th century in Central Europe. This is precisely what Jews were changing. Uh, Moshe was becoming Moritz, they were adopting European dress, um, and so on and so forth. He, of course, discouraged this. He argued that Yiddish was the Jews' language. God had created it specifically so they wouldn't speak Gentile languages, and that Jews should keep the traditions of their forefathers. On the other hand, we have the Haskalah, and we have here Leopold Sunz, Leop otherwise known as Yantif, uh, Sons, that was his original name, Yantif Lipman, traditional Ashkenazic name, who became one of the most prominent scholars of modern Jewish studies in the 19th century from a traditional home who acculturated and became a German speaker. In the 1830s, he was hired by the Jewish community of Berlin specifically to scientifically defend the thesis that Jews have always borrowed names from their neighbors. The reason why he was asked to do this was that there were people who were arguing, non-Jews that is, that Jews should not be allowed to take non-Jewish names because non-Jewish names, first of all, don't belong to them. Secondly, they make them inconspicuous. You can no longer identify Jews easily when they have non-Jewish names. So a name like Moritz should not be used by Jews. They should stick to names like Moses and so on. What Sun showed was, of course, that throughout the ages, Jews had always borrowed names. In fact, that list that I showed you just a moment ago was largely the kind of research that Sunz came up with. He also showed that there were no inherently Jewish nor inherently Christian names. Pretty much the only inherently Christian names were names like Christopher, the bearer, the carrier of Christ, or Christina. All the other names that Christians used were either borrowed by Jews or were typically of pagan origin or re relatively recent coinage. So he completely destroyed the idea that there were specifically Jewish or Christian names in order to demonstrate that why shouldn't Jews take on modern names used by their non-Jewish neighbors to help them with their integration. Now, this brings us to the topic of family names. So now I'm going to get to the nitty gritty of how Jews actually got their names. So firstly, let me bring up the distinction between Ashkenazic Jews and other communities. I'm mainly going to talk about Sephardic Jews. I'm going to leave out all of the other Jews, the, the Romagnot Jews, the Mizrahi Jews, and so on. Um, let me say about Sephardic Jews, first of all, that they had hereditary surnames by the medieval period, so long before Ashkenazic Jews did. Right, uh, Ashkenazic Jews, with few exceptions, did not start taking on family names until the 19th century. The only place that Jews had hereditary surnames was pretty much Prague prior to the 19th century. And there were certain rabbinic, prestigious rabbinic families that had surnames, very often families who come from Prague. These names often reflect geography. Names like Horowitz, for example, are geographic names. Other prestigious rabbinic names are Edinger, Margolis, Margolis meaning pearls. But everybody else really doesn't get a fixed family name in Central and Eastern Europe until sometime around the 19th century. Now, as you're probably familiar, most Ashkenazic names have a German or a Slavic sound to them. And of course, it's obvious why, because these were the languages of the states in which they lived. 
whether it was the Russian Empire or the Austro-Hungarian Empire or the German Empire. How did they get these names? Uh, this is a complicated story that I'm going to reduce to a very simple paradigm. Uh, it really depends on where you were. Jews begin to get names in Austria-Hungary in the last quarter of the 18th century. A little bit later, they start getting names in other parts of Eastern Europe. Usually these names were chosen by Jews themselves or by Jewish communal officials. Sometimes they were conceived by government officials themselves, especially if Jews could not choose on a name for themselves. Uh, these government officials had a bunch of schemes for creating Jewish names, as did the Jewish communal authorities. Sometimes they created names that mock Jews, but most of the time they created names based on physical characteristics, their occupations, uh, qualities of their personalities, or some other characteristic that was known about them, or by pairing together a bunch of words that meant something pretty. And I'll show you that process in just a moment. Even though they got names by the 19th century, however, most Jews really didn't pay much attention to them until the late 19th and the early 20th century. Uh, just to illustrate my point, very often Jews did not register their marriages with government officials in Eastern Europe, even though they were supposed to. Uh, they got married by the local rabbi and they reported the mother's name. So there are lots of families that were officially, uh, from the standpoint of government records, the children were illegitimate. The parents weren't married. From the standpoint of the Jewish community, however, the parents were married because they've been married by a rabbi. But to avoid conscription or taxes or some other problem, some other intervention by the state that was not desired, they didn't report the father's name because the father and mother were never officially married. Uh, for all of these reasons, Jews did not pay much attention to their family names until quite late. They rely on their traditional family, traditional ways of naming their children to distinguish them. It simply wasn't necessary. And the same thing largely applies for their, their non-Jewish neighbors. Now, the other thing I will mention is the one exception to this rule of German and Slavic names, and that's the case of Hungary. Uh, Hungarian Jews began to take on German sounding names in the first half of the 19th century because Hungary was the official language of that part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Of course, it doesn't really become officially the Austro-Hungarian Empire until a bit later, the mid 19th century. And Hungarian becomes an official language, it becomes the language of state there. And there's a very strong movement for acculturation. Jews in Hungary, particularly in the second part of the 19th century, will begin to replace their German sounding names with Hungarian sounding names. So for instance, Wolf or Wolf becomes Farkas. Usually they took the meaning of the name in German and simply transplanted it into a Hungarian name. And there are many, many examples of this. Of all the Jews of Europe, probably the most acculturated prior to World War II were the Hungarian Jews. Now here are the schemes for the creation of family names. And this is again, this is a simplification. There's more to this story, but I'm gonna hit the major points. First of all, patronymics. All European societies like to use patronymics, by which I mean taking the name of the father and adding son to it, deriving a name based on the father's name. And of course, in Jewish tradition, you have names with Ben. Uh, I'm Kalman, son of uh, Benjamin, Ben Benjamin, so I could become Benjamin's son. Uh, you add Zon in German speaking lands, or some variant like Son, or Vich, or Witz which are Slavic variants of this. They both mean son of, or Vichy is very common in Romania. You take a name like Bear or Berko, which is a derivative of Bear. It becomes Berkowitz, Berkovich or Berkovici. You take the name Koppel, which is Isaac, uh, which is Jacob rather, I'm sorry, like Ted Koppel, the famous newscaster, or famous to people of a certain age at least. This name becomes Koppelvich. Yudel, which is Yehuda, in Yiddish, Yudel or Yidel becomes Yudelson, and so on. Matronymics are very common. It was a very fast way to produce names in the Russian Empire to add I-N. I-N is a matronymic Slavic suffix. But you also have the same son and zone as you do in other, as we saw before. So Sarah becomes Sarah zone. Or in Yiddish, one of the versions of Sole or Sule, you get names like Sorkin, Dworkin from Devoyle, Deborah, 
Uh, so you have names like Sorkin and Dworkin, which are probably familiar with you from the Hollywood context. Professions, very common amongst all cultures. Schneider, Snyder, Hayat, Kravitz or Kravitz, Kravchik, Portnoy, all mean a tailor, okay? Um, very common profession amongst the Jews of Eastern Europe. And of course, that's only one profession amongst many. Of course, there are nicknames that lead to family names, often based on physical characteristics, such as Schwartz or Schwarz for someone who has dark hair or a dark complexion, Geduldig for someone who is patient. Of course, that's not a physical characteristic, that's a characteristic of personality. Uh, vice for someone who has white hair, um, and so on and so forth, many physical characteristics. Of course, if you were unlucky, you got a name like Affengesicht. Affengesicht in German is a monkey's face, or a name like um, Stunk that suggested you had an odor. But that was not the usual names that Jews got. They usually got names that were neutral or fairly positive. There were place names, very common source of names. Uh, here you see it in multiple versions. So someone is from whose family originally came from Berlin is a Berliner. Someone who was Krakowski, the family came from Kraków in Poland. The same game goes with the name Krakauer. Uh, Litvak suggests that your family came from the territory of Lita, which is basically today's northern Ukraine, Belarus, and Lithuania area. Horowitz and Epstein are place names from the Czech territories. If you go to the Sephardic world and you meet someone whose name is Ashkenazi, lots of Sephardic Jews today have the name Ashkenazi, which simply means German, it suggests that this person's ancestors were actually Ashkenazi Jews who'd migrated to Turkey or wherever else. And there are a number of these Sephardic names that are actually of Ashkenazi origin. The same thing goes with Italian names for Italian Jewish names like Marpurgo. Marpurgo is someone whose family came from Marburg in Germany. There was a large, in the 16th and 17th centuries, there was a significant number of Ashkenazi Jews in Northern Italy, for example. Of course, over time, they became assimilated into the local Italian population and largely forgot their Ashkenazi origins. Then there's the category of fanciful and decorative names. Names like Goldberg, Goldwasser, Rosenberg, Grushka, Jagoda. Uh, you took a name from a color, you took a name from something that's beautiful in the landscape, like a mountain or water, and you got these names. Uh, some of them in English sound ridiculous today. You know, you think of Goldwasser, like Barry Goldwater. Uh, forgive my reference, but you think of urine. Uh, I don't think that's what they had in mind. I think they meant a golden stream in a different sense. Um, but that was a common Jewish name. Rosenberg, of course, Mountain of Roses. Grushka is a pear tree. Yagoda is a berry. All right, so there are many of these kinds of names often created by, by government officials who were trying to make names fast for Jews so they could register them. So they took names from different categories, categories and paired them together. Of course, there are the names derived from religious functions, like Cohen. In the Slavic context, particularly in Russia, there's no ha sound. So Hamlet becomes Gamyet. Uh, Cohen becomes Kogan, from which you get names like Kaganovich, uh, Kogansky and so on. Levi, of course, has many variants. Uh, Levinas is simply the name Levi with a Lithuanian suffix added to it, like the famous uh, Lithu Jew Jewish philosopher from Lithuania happens also to be my wife's name. She's a Levinas. When they moved to Israel, they decided they had to be Levinas to distinguish from all the other Levies in the phone book. And of course, there's a category of names, often religious significance, based on combinations of words or their shortening. So for instance, cats comes from Kohen Sedek. It doesn't come from the word for a cat. And you get a number of names like this. And from cats, you get Katzman, Katzberg, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole variety of names in this category. Now, what about first names? Um, firstly, we have to talk about living in the dead. Uh, as you probably know, Eastern European Ashkenazi Jews do not name traditionally after the living, it's taboo. Western Ashkenazi Jews often do name after the living, like in Holland, and non-Ashkenazi Jews typically name after the living, 
I'm from a mixed marriage. My mother's family is from Greece. My father's family is from Eastern Europe. They named my brother after my mother's father. Um, so he was named after living. My Ashkenazi grandfather, they decided to honor him. He was Kalman by naming me after him. At first he protested because this was taboo, but he saw that my older brother was still alive. So he permitted me to be named after him. But typically for Yiddish speaking Jews, this is a taboo. There's also a distinction between vernacular names and holy names, sacred names, and the usage between men and women. So men usually have a vernacular name and a sacred name. Uh, the sacred name is a name that you're called to the Torah to read from, the name that you're given at your circumcision, your bris when you're a male. It has to be taken from a certain number of traditional Jewish names, which are usually from the Hebrew Bible and post-biblical literature, plus a small class of names, usually of Greek origin, like Kalman, that became popular amongst Jews, but it's a fixed canon of names. Whereas women can take on vernacular names. They don't need Hebrew names from the Bible because they don't need to be called to read, to read from the Torah in traditional Jewish communities. This is why you get such a different distinction with women with all these vernacular names like Lazel and Blima and so on, Rose and, and Flower as a name, whereas men usually have to have a Hebrew name in quotation marks, a sacred name. Very common amongst Ashkenazic Jews is also so-called double names, names like Dov Be'er, Avram Itzik, Sura Rifke. Uh, it's very useful to compare, combine a Yiddish name with a Hebrew name to add gravitas, to add weight to a name, but it also helped in traditional Jewish society distinguish people. Maybe there were two Be'ers. How do you know which Be'er is, be is which? You gave an additional name. Or there are two Rifkes, you gave them an additional name and this made clear which Rifka you're talking about. Of course, there were other schemes also. There was also, you know, there was Dov Be'er Rifkes. Men are often known by their wives in traditional Ashkenazic society. Dov Be'er Rifkes husband or the son of so on. The, uh, men were often known by their mothers in shtetl culture. When a children die, or when a children was near death, very often the children survived. The child was given a new name. Um, this is true of all Jewish communities, not just Ashkenazi communities. So children would be given names like Chaim or Chaya for life or Alter or Alta for girls to, to confuse the angel of death, to mislead them to thinking that we're dealing with a old person and a child. So this is all part of the complicated ways that Jews gave names that were so confusing to non-Jewish government authorities. Now, as Jews began to finally acculturate by the late 19th century, and particularly in the 20th century, they went through a familiar process in pretty much every land. And this is a process that I'm sure you're familiar with. That is, first of all, their traditional Jewish names were usually relegated to synagogue life, to ritual purposes. Uh, these names in English, we usually call them the Hebrew name. You know, you have an everyday name and you have a Hebrew name that you only use when you get married or a bris or something like this, your bar mitzvah. But in everyday life, you know, you're known by Scott, but only in synagogue you're known as Shlaime or Shlomo. The other pattern that's come probably familiar to you is how vernacular first names shift over time to bear a, resembl a resemblance to traditional Jewish names, but to become part of the general culture. So for instance, if you have a Dov Be'er who wanted to acculturate, he or his child, someone named after him that is, was perhaps Bernard. Why Bernard? Because Bernard sounds like Be'er. In the next generation or a generation later, Bernard often becomes Robert. It preserves something of the sound of Be'er, but it's a fully integrated name. And of course, you can see this in all European societies and in North America. In the Russian context, you have a name like Hirsch, Hirsch very often becomes Gregory. Why Gregory, Grigory? Because Grisha, the nickname for Gregory, sounds like Hirsch. And there are many, many examples of this. The first generation of Soviet Jews gave Russian names that were of biblical origin, that non-Jews used. The second generation, after, particularly after World War II, only gave those names of biblical origin that non-Jews also used, didn't give names that non-Jews didn't use because they wanted to preserve some tie to their Jewish origins, to their family, to their ancestors, but they didn't want to stand out as Jews 
So names like Sarah disappeared, but names like Grisha could continue. Now this brings me to one of the final topics I'm going to talk about today, and that's escaping the stigma of Jewish names. Now, as I've already made clear, there are a lot of problems with Jewish names uh, and the attention they got from anti-Semites of the 19th century in Europe and elsewhere. It wasn't legal to change your name everywhere. In fact, in the Russian empire, it wasn't even legal for Jews who converted to Christianity to change their family names. But in places like Germany, by the second half of the 19th century, it was possible, and it was certainly possible in Hungary. And you get these very interesting changes that happen along certain patterns. Very often, the name is simply translated. So Schneid, the name is either translated in meaning or simply the sounds are taken over. So Sabo becomes a very common name amongst Hungarian Jews who were formerly Schneider. Khan, which in German, happens to mean a small boat. It's also the uh, der name derived from Cohen, becomes Schiff, because Schiff is another word for a ship or boat, right? In a way, they're preserving their Jewish identities, but disguising them in a way that's only intelligible to fellow Jews. Of course, with the rise of the Zionist movement, we get the Hebraization of names, not because Jewish it was a taboo to be Jewish, but because diaspora names were, were a taboo, particularly Yiddish names. So you get names like Gottesman, uh, Man of God, becoming Bar El. The famous actress and model uh, Gal Gadot was her family was Greenstein before they became Gadot. And there are many, many examples of this uh, in Israel for a long time. If you wanted to serve the state, if you wanted to become a diplomat, you had to Hebraicize your name. And many people simply thought this was a good idea for the sake of integrating or to start a new life in Israel. Now, there's a famous myth that Kirsten from Magla has thoroughly debunked in her book that I mentioned earlier, the myth of Ellis Island, that Jewish names were changed when people came to Ellis Island. You're probably familiar with the joke uh, about Sean Ferguson. How did you get the name Sean Ferguson? Well, they asked me, what's my name? And I didn't really understand the question, or I thought they were asking me something else. And I said, Hab Sean Fergessen. And Sean Fergessen became Sean Ferguson. It's a completely apocryphal story the immigrants came with their names written on ship manifests. There were lots of translators provided by Jewish organizations at Ellis Island, as well as non-Jewish organizations. There was little problem with communicating your name. Some Jews chose, however, to change their names, usually after they'd been in the country for a while. And we have all the court proceedings. The reasons why they did it are often quite interesting, not simply to escape anti-Semitism, although that happens sometimes. Very often, it's simply because the names were too difficult to spell or pronounce. Uh, I have a colleague, Sarah Horowitz. Horowitz is a very, obviously, very stereotypically Jewish name in North America. Her family name was much less Jewish sounding upon immigration, but they chose it to Horowitz because no one could knew what to do with it. No one could spell it. So they just chose another Jewish name, Horowitz. In the Soviet Union, unfortunately, there was this tendency, particularly after World War II, to expose Jews as Zionists. What they meant by Zionists, and I put it in quotation marks, were basically Jews. Uh, Zionists became a term of derision, a term of opprobrium for Jews in the Soviet Union after World War II. They would place the names of prominent Soviet Jews. In parentheses, they put their Jewish name. If they changed their name to a Slavic name, as was often common amongst early Bolsheviks, to put their original name in parentheses, sometimes they'd invent a Jewish sounding name. They didn't do this with other people usually. They wanted to signal that these criminals were all Jews. So they put their Jewish names in parentheses. Now I'm going to end by bringing things up to date, uh, talking about the problems and the joys of traditional Jewish names today. There is a tremendous cultural dislocation that we've experienced as Yiddish has declined, as familiarity with traditional Jewish naming practices has declined. Uh, I'll give you just an example from my grandmother. My grandmother was named, my grandmother was Shendel. Her father was Chuna. Chuna is a variant on the name Elchanan. It's an Aramaic variant on the name Elchanan. It's spelled Chet Nun Aleph but her gravestone says that she's the daughter of Hana. Hana, of course, is a woman's name. My great-grandfather was made into a woman, Chet Nun Hei. 
because no one, the people who are putting the gravestones together were not familiar with this name. Uh, there's, I was told when visiting Yad Vashem that early on there were lots of problems registering the names of the dead Jews who died in concentration camps because many of the people who were working there who were not from Ashkenazi background or simply did not know Jewish naming practices from that part of the world were, couldn't make sense of all of these Ashkenazic names. Uh, we see this on gravestones. We sometimes see this on marriage certificates, uh, purposes of burial. It's a problem. It's being corrected over time, but it's still an issue. People need to learn these practices in order to understand how to deal with the traditional Ashkenazic names. And of course, this problem that may be familiar to you is synagogues. Uh, when someone is called to, for a mishaberach, for a prayer for the dead, uh, the prayer for the ill in the synagogue, and they ask someone, well, what was your aunt's name? Well, what was Auntie Rose's Hebrew name, meaning her Jewish name? Was it Lazel? Was it Shoshana? No one knows that Auntie Rose was actually Chaya, and they just called her Rose. We've lost names. We've lost this kind of knowledge. People don't know how to spell these names quite often. You see multiple spellings. So all of this is very complicated for ritual purposes. It's very complicated for genealogists, um, which is why people like me can make a living because we can talk about these things to people who are interested in these topics. Finally, I will mention the latest trends in naming practices. Uh, we see a resurgence of old school Jewish names. If you go to the local JCC here in Toronto and you look at the kindergarten or the uh, daycare, you'll see lots of names like Bessie, Rose, Saul, Nathan, Jacob, et cetera, are making a resurgence. These are the names of the first generation of immigrants to North America who had traditional Jewish names, but then became Americanized with these variants. It's very common. That's one, that's one uh, variation that's happening amongst young Jews. But there are other names, too, that are in circulation. In Israel, we have all sorts of distinctions between the religious, secular, the religious and the secular, between the Arab Palestinian population of Israel, between the various Jewish subgroups, Sephardic, Mizrahi, and Ashkenazi, which give different names. We have more traditional names like Abraham amongst the religious Jews, more non-traditional names, very often new names, very often internationalisms or ungendered names, names like Tal, which is neither male or female clearly being given, uh, names like Tom, which is an internationalism, Thomas being given in Israel. And of course, in North America, we have still this tradition of double names, vernacular names, I'm Keith, but I am also Kalman. We also have Israeli names being given to children quite often, but often with a time lag. Uh, my children are Orly and Talia, which Orly was a name that's very popular a number of years ago. Most Orlys in Israel are in their 50s, but my daughter is nine. And of course, we have traditional religious names being given here in North America, usually amongst Orthodox Jews. We've come full circle and I'll end it with this. I've said a lot and I'm eager to hear your comments and questions. We've come to a point where we now there's a widespread joke about the boy who's named Shlomo here in North America. How did you come up with the name Shlomo? I named him after his grandfather, Scott. The story is of course about a family that acculturated in the suburbs of North America. Then they became religious, eventually became Orthodox and the grandchildren are named after their secular grandfather by given a traditional Hebrew name that's no longer common outside of the Orthodox world in North America. And I'll end with that. I've said a lot. So I'll give you a chance to express yourselves. Let me just stop my screen share. Thank you okay. so much, Colin. Thank you. That was fantastic. Wow, chock full of information. Uh, we, have, we have a few questions. Uh, actually, not, not as many as I thought, maybe more will come. Um, but uh, one of them has to do with names related to food, uh, like Zweibel, you know, like, do you have any idea where those last names would have come from? Um, some of them come from, of course, from things like uh, trees and nature and nature. There's a lot of Jewish names that have their origins in nature. Uh, whether they're, they're probably more obvious to us in their Germanic forms, like Birnbaum is a pear tree, or Yiddish variant is Baron Boim, like the famous conductor. 
but they're also they are hidden, so to speak, in Slavic languages because the Slavic forms are less obvious to us. Um, so there's a lot of food that comes in that way. Uh, okay. Um, I, I have kind of a related question to that. Uh, so you mentioned that all these officials, uh, Polish officials, Hungarian officials, and so forth, were, were handing out these names and trying to come up with appropriate ones. Uh, but what about the, the, the tradition of paying for names? Did, did, do you know anything much about that? I mean, did, did yeah, people I don't get know. better names yeah. because they, they paid more, you know, so they got- I, I don't know for certain. Also. This is a very interesting topic. There's lots of apocryphal stories about how Jews got their names. And I only touched on the main categories and ways they got them. This is, I think, is a topic that needs to be researched more. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not, not inconceivable that bribes were given at certain times to get a better name or to prevent a horrible name from being given to somebody. Uh, certainly bribes were given in order for a written name to be registered in a different way in order to avoid something that was considered horrible, uh, whether it was taxes or military service or something. And we know many stories, you know, there's, I was just told a story here uh, by someone named Bernie Farber, who's a famous human rights activist here in Canada. He told me a story. He said, you should contact this other guy named Farber. He's related to me, but he's not related to me. The story is that actually he was this and this, his, his father, but when they, after the Holocaust, they came to Canada, they needed to get into the country. So someone, my relative vouched for him as being his relative, even though they weren't related at all. So he gave his name as Farber too. Now there was no bribery involved there, but you can imagine there were many Jews who were paying other Jews in various ways to help them with their names for whatever purpose. So it's certainly not inconceivable, but we don't know of a systematic pattern of this happening. Uh -huh. Okay, so, so it wasn't like if you didn't pay up, you got the name Stunk, right? <laughs> it's, it's, look, it's conceivable that that sometimes happened, but it wasn't government policy to punish people for not paying their taxes by giving them lousy <laughs> names, yeah, you know. Uh, Wanzenreich, you know, your the 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 realm of bedbugs. I mean, there are some very funny Jewish names, horrible Jewish names. I have a relative whose name is Krumbein, crooked legs. I mean, certainly some uh, Galician Polish Galician German speaking official didn't like his family. I think, uh, <laughs> but you know, I think that was because he was a nasty. Someone was nasty, either the official or the his ancestor. <laughs> So I see there are a lot of questions about people's names in particular. I don't know if we want to go there, Kalman, but so I'm going to try to focus first on some questions that are a little more general. Um, so uh, one, one person asked, this is Jordan Chad. He asks, uh, was there any system to giving Jewish children two names, uh, like a sacred name as the first name, and then a non-sacred name as the middle name? Um, yeah. Uh, or, or was none of this standardized? It's, there are patterns. It's not standardized, but there are patterns. So Dovber is a very common pairing. Uh, Ichemaya was a very common pairing in Poland after the Gera Rebbe. Um, sometimes these pairings have to do with the names meaning the same thing. Dov and Ber are the same thing. Arieleib, both mean lion. Sometimes you have a name like uh, Sura Rifke. Uh, they're matriarchs, um, but sometimes the, the correspondence is not clear at all, like a Chaim Fischl. There's no clear reason that I'm aware of why a Chaim and Fischl got put together. Um, so there are, but there are very clear patterns of this. Menachem Mendel, uh, Menachem is associated with Mendel. It's a very common Lubavitcher name. Yeah. Of course, Menachem Mendel Schneerson. Okay, uh, so it became common just... Be, yeah, just, and, you know, people model famous. themselves with these common patterns, but there's no absolute in all of this. There are names that have no... We can't find a clear association between them. There are, there are several questions about the Ellis Island myth, um, about the immigration officials and, and, and so forth. Do you have any ideas where, where this came about, how this came about? Sure. First, I'll say for my Canadian audience, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about Halifax. Uh, you know, whenever I'm here in Canada, so I tell these stories, 
and people always raise their hand in anger. My family came through Halifax and Pier 51. I think it's 51. I forget the pier number. And this is absolutely what had happened. And I tell them, listen, I don't know about Canada. No one's thoroughly researched this, but it's been thoroughly researched in the United States. Uh, if it didn't happen in the UN, United States, it's quite possible it didn't happen in Canada either this way, because as I said, all these ship manifests were available and so on. Uh, these stories probably originated because, you know, it's, it's like folk etymologies. We try to explain things that would no longer make sense to us. You know, um, my family from, from Turkey and Greece is full of stories about the Sultan and his, his harem and so on. And I check the facts of history and I look at the dates and I see none of this matches up. But we have memory in the family lore of some general being interested in some girl and trying to take her for his harem. And when we fill it in with the knowledge that we have, and of course, we transpose our contemporary knowledge and sentiments onto the past, and it often doesn't align up. So I think in the case of Jews with names, you know, we lost the reasons why we changed our names. Very often we changed them for reasons that we're not particularly proud of. Or we, you know, it was long and complicated and it was caused a much suffering in the whole process, going to court and making arguments and maybe perhaps being refused and then finally being accepted the name change. I think it's, was, it's uncomfortable for us. You know, there's a stigma about changing your name. As I mentioned earlier, Jews think that they change their family names, which their families have only had for a generation or two or three. They think that they are running away from being Jewish. Uh, it's much more palatable to assume that your ancestors have this name change thrust upon them than that they thought than the fact that was that they thought it was better for business to change their names or something like this. Um, but there's complicated reasons. And I actually I really recommend that you read for Madhuk's book because she explores some of these issues. Why did Jews actually change their names? And it's very different from what their families two or three generations later think they did. Yeah, there are um, really a number of questions about, um, you know, where, where to get more information. Uh, I don't think we're going to be able to answer specific questions about where certain names came from, uh, but where, where could people go to get maybe yeah, more information? Yeah, so the first thing is, of course, the, the probably the greatest expert on names nowadays is a scholar who lives in Paris, from, originally from the Soviet Union, uh, named Alexander Bider who's published massive tomes on Ashkenazic and non-Ashkenazic names, both family names and personal names. So this is, you know, this is an absolute, you need to go there to see this. By the way, the Jewish genealogy website has published a lot of basic information about decoding Jewish names and the kinds of transformations I showed you in the first slide. How does some guy who's whose name is Seichet becomes Sochet, which becomes Shochet, which becomes Saket. And, you know, what do you make of all of this? Um, also about uh, names, um, just trying to think. There's a number of guides to Ashkenazic names that you're particularly interested in, uh, books you can find on Amazon, certainly a lot of scholarly literature. About the Ellis Island business, I highly recommend for Maglick's book, of course, it's only really dealing with the United States, but you'll find in the bibliography a rich body of literature about this. Can you, can you and, write that name in the chat, perhaps, the, uh, the name of that book? The name of that it's book? Called, well, book? I, I'm, I'm very bad with writing in the chat, okay, but I'll tell you it's one. called A Rosenberg by Any Other Name. Okay, great. Um, right. Yeah. And the name is Kirsten for Maglick. F-E-R-M-A-G-L-I-C-H. Great. Um, right, so I'm, I'm gonna just, I will type it in, Kirsten for Maglech. Um, okay, great. Okay, um, I think um, the other questions are, are just too specific. Um, so I think that's that is that is it. I think that um, we have <laughs> addressed <clears throat> this question of names to the best of our ability. <clears throat> so thank you so much again, Kalman. Yeah, thank and, you for listening. And and we look very much forward to the next uh, talk in the series, uh, which is uh, March thirteenth. And um, is it March or is it February? I'm sorry, February, forgive yeah, me, okay. February. February is the next one and then March we have Good, because I would show up in March and then I forget February to be a problem. 
<clears throat> no, 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 February. Uh, and um, we look forward to that. So a grüßen herzlichen Dank and a herzlichen Dank zu allemen. Alle wir haben Anteil genommen und sich gut zugehört. And there's some interesting things happening in the chat. Some people are writing some references as well. Uh, so check that out before <clears throat> before we head off. Okay. okay so. Schönen Dank. Herzlichen Dank, Carmen. Sei, sei gesinnt. Sei gesinnt. Hat mir gesinnt und stark.